Hey, what's up, guys, and welcome to episode 103 of Talk 4, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me, and let me introduce our special guest for today, Mike Sorelli. He's going to be answering some questions today. Mike, how's it going, man? Thanks for joining me for the show today. Dude, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure, man. Um, right, let's uh, let's kick this off with... Uh, a quick like 30 to 60 second ish like who you are and what you do and stuff and then we're going to dig into the questions a bit of backstory and uh find our way into some actionable intel at the end too so yeah 30 to 60 seconds elevator pitch what do you do what's your daily uh sh- schedule looking like oh so you know one I'm, I'm retired military and uh when people ask me what i do i still don't have a good uh answer my wife says a lot of things very few well uh i've written some books not war books um I own a uh, production company alongside Dan Myrick, who's the famed filmmaker who did Blair Witch. I've got an expedition company. I mainly do leadership talking, culture, high-performing teams, as well as executive search. So, and then I run Men's Journal, uh, Men's Journal's Everyday Warrior, which is one of their biggest initiatives. So I'm still five years retired, uh, still figuring it out myself. I'm 46 years young, so I got time. Looks like you're figuring it out the right the right way though, and it's a it's a hell of a career you've got going there. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's start off at the uh, at the military career then. So question one, um, at the beginning, obviously walk us through the kind of the journey into becoming a SEAL. Uh, what was the motivation for you there, and just kind of take us through the early career and a bit of Hell Week trivia if you can too. Uh, so you know my route to the SEAL teams was a little non traditional. Uh, I started out in the Marine Corps. I was a recon Marine. So I went through their assessment and selection program. I was also a scout sniper and was preparing to become a Marine officer when the war kicked off and made the decision to go over to the SEALs. Um, I know some SEALs like to talk about how we can, it, it's in, in SEAL training, it's hard. There's no debating that, but uh, you got to understand stepping into SEAL training and still representing the Marine Corps in a way, even though now I was a Navy officer. Uh, there was just no way I was going to quit. Plus the war was going on. It was almost like, Hey, let's do this as quickly as possible. I want to get to a SEAL team. I want to uh, actually get in the fight. Cause I'd been in the military about uh, five years before I got to buds. How come you, um, how come you changed that career path then? And why did, why did you go to the SEALs after being in, in the Marine Corps then? Uh, I would have stayed a Marine. However, the Marine Corps was not in the special operations community, what we refer to as SOCOM at the time, they are now, they made that decision in 2005, six ish. Um, But uh, since we were not in SOCOM, we didn't have the funding that, you know, the Green Berets, SEALs, Air Force Special Operations had. Um, We didn't have the weapons. We didn't, and we, we, we missed out on missions because it always went to the Green Berets. It always went to the Air Force Special Operations. It always went to the SEALs. And I think that hit my ego a little bit. And everyone always talked about SEALs, though it's the toughest military training in the world. And it's almost like that, that, that masculinity, that that ego thing where you're like, well, if that's the toughest training in the world, then I got to give it a shot. And uh, it was tough. It was also fun. And also you, you form bonds with human beings that sometimes are tighter than your own actual familia. Um, and in... I I don't regret one moment in the military. Yeah, there's a lot of stupid times in the military. That's just, that's just the military. Um, but man, if I could go back and do it again, even all the pain, I would do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, was there any um so kind of going out of the the Marine Corps and going into the SEALs? Was there any? Was there any? Like you said, obviously slightly unconventional route into that. But was there any stick for you there from the guys going into that? Um, was it quite competitive or was that kind of just like, I, I don't know, what, what was the, the culture like there around that uh, that move? Uh, I, so internally, I got a lot of uh, crap from my guys, but all in good fun. Um, and it actually was a Marine Corps major who was about to pick up Lieutenant Colonel and he was a mentor of mine. And he commissioned me, discharged me as a, as a Marine Sergeant and commissioned me as a Navy Ensign on the same day. And when we were walking back, to our little command post, he said, Hey, do me a favor. And I said, what, sir? And he said, just remember this. If you quit, you'll embarrass the Marine Corps. And, uh, we were both laughing in uniform, like bent over on our knees, just crying and laughter. And he was making a joke, but there was also a bit of truth in there. But, um, as an officer to get an officer billet there, you had to compete with all the guys coming out of the academies. 
which the guys coming out of the academies are just on point. They're physically fit. They're really smart, just like total human specimens. And then you also had to uh, compete against all the guys coming out of different universities. So you actually had to attend a summer tryout before uh, the year you actually graduated. And I think there's like something like 50 to 75 people competing for uh, like 20 officer slots each year. So yeah, it was competitive. And, um, you know, I, they, I, I made the selection. So yeah, I'm humble. sure did. No embarrassment for the Marine Corps then. And clearly, um, so yeah, you've just made it through hell week. Um, was it straight to team three for you then? Or what was the kind of the build up to that? Like, and where did you go straight away? And, um, where did you, uh, where did you serve? So, uh, from there after I think the year pipeline, I ended up at seal team three. Uh, I got one very quick deployment to Baghdad and Ramadi in 2005 and then came back and did what we call a workup. That's where you train as an element to go back to uh, a theater and uh, ended up back in the Battle of Ramadi in 2006. Did that again with SEAL Team 3, the Battle of uh, Sadr City in 2008. And then from there, I went to SEAL training to run something called the Junior Officer Training Course, which is basically where I got the young officers graduating from SEAL training. And I had one month to teach them how to be a ground force commander which I loved. I loved teaching in that knowledge transfer. Not that I was the best, but uh, eventually from there, I uh, screened for a organization called the Joint Special Operations Command and uh, deployed a lot more with them. And eventually, you know, after 10 deployments, I was at 18 years and uh, needed uh, a break because I was going through a divorce in, in the SEAL community and JSOC took took good care of me and uh, ended up in Austin, Texas, getting my MBA. And I was supposed to go back to the, to a unit and I was just burnt out. And I was at 20 years, which is, you can retire 20 years. And they said, okay, put, put your retirement paperwork in. And I did, and that's it. It was over. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's a loaded career, man. Um, I mean, well done to you. It's a, a serious accomplishment for all of it from the start to the finish. But yeah, so kind of reading up on the uh, the website, looking at the bio and everything, Um, obviously you definitely saw your fair share of combat in Team 3. And like you said, uh, out in Ramadi and, and more places like that. So uh, in the SEAL teams, I'm not too familiar with the kind of the process there, but how did you kind of come to take up that position of leadership within the team and the missions? And, uh, you know, what were some of the kind of like the big principles that made leading effective for you out there and, uh, and at least simple and achievable? So kind of... Uh, Give us the history and the rundown of it, but also maybe lace in some uh, some to dos and and pointers for it. Well, yeah, I'll say this: whether regardless of what service you're in, and I've served with you know British uh, SBS um, who are just absolutely uh, top notch. British uh, Royal Marines, the militaries are very good at training you to do your job, and it requires a lot of coaching and mentoring, and almost setting people up for failure in training. Uh, not to embarrass them, but to reinforce. I mean, we learn through failure. Failure is your greatest mentor if you know how to receive it. If, if you fail, that means you're human. It's not an indictment on your character. But the core principles with leading, first off, I had great coaches and mentors in the Marine Corps. I had great coaches and mentors in, uh, in, in the SEALs that if they saw me stumbling as a leader, they pulled me aside and said, come here, young buck. Let's talk through how you approach that, why it went wrong, what you learned and what you could do differently in the future. But, you know, I put an emphasis on love. People ask me how I led in the military. I led through love. I loved my guys much more than I hated the enemy. And the highest form of compassion is accountability, not only for yourself. I mean, the highest form of self-love is self-accountability and self-discipline. But within those environments that have such a high standard, um, we hold each other accountable. In, in, in a professional and attackful way. And we want to see everyone succeed. And we'll do everything in the world to make sure that they're at the standard for whatever unit they're in, up for the task that they're being uh, assigned. So, I mean, just, we trained all the time. We had talks about leadership all the time. Um, everyone had to know their roles and responsibilities and how they contributed to the overall win. And, you know, if people are looking for some just whiz bang secret sauce to leadership it's all, leadership is time tested fundamental principles and high performing teams i mean you look at the attributes of high performing teams optimism we over me um accountability trust and vulnerability you cannot have high performing teams without trust and vulnerability 
trust that everyone around you will do their roles and responsibilities, that they'll do the right thing. And then vulnerability, you don't often don't hear that with like special operations, but you know, you've got to be vulnerable to say, Hey, I screwed up there. And this is what I learned. And if you guys end up in the same scenario, don't do what I did. And you're, you're learning from each other, but um, you know, high performing teams that just have these, these, these common traits, regardless of what industry you're in, whether it's sports, manufacturing technology, all these, these high performing teams have these, these common traits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in your opinion, then are leaders born or made because something that I've kind of picked up at least along the way with my conversations prior um, with other SEALs and stuff is, and also kind of reading a load of books as, as well too, is that SEALs as like a general community and soldiers, they are also their own leaders in a way too. So they are like ready to step up and fill a gap if there needs to be that. So um, uh, are they, are they all leaders? Are, are they made into leaders, all the SEALs or are they born that way? And you just find that select bunch, you find that, that calling. So yeah, a bit of info there if you can. Leaders, leaders are made. They're not born. Um, now are people born with different genetic uh, capabilities, whether it's, you know, intellect or, um, you know, physiologically or physically, yes. But um, leaders like teams, te like great teams are forged. They're, they're not born and, and leaders are forged. They're not born. If you look at Mike, not to use my name in the third person, as a 16, 17, 18 year old, no one would have ever said, hey, that kid's a future leader. But then I end up in Marine Corps boot camp being uh, yelled at by guys in the Smokey the Bear hat, drill instructors who you look up to, just everything about them, the amount of discipline and, and the pride for which they carry themselves and the fact that they'll see a mission through come hell or high water, they're gonna achieve the mission. You start, it's, it's like that old Bible proverb, iron sharpens iron, as, as, you know, so as one man sharpens another. Um, the Marine Corps, and, and in credit to my parents as well, they, they, they poured into me. The Marine Corps absolutely made me into the man uh, I was. And then the SEALs got a, a, a product and they continued to chisel, chisel uh, away at it. But, you know, you've got to pour into the people below you. You've got to do constant coaching, mentoring, and, and let them fail from time to time. When it's not going to be catastrophic to the organization, let them fail and then be right there to pick them up and help them learn from their, uh, their mistakes. So anyone who says, you know, Teddy Roosevelt or Winston Church, Churchill were born as leaders, that's wrong. They, they were forged by a series of great coaches and mentors throughout their life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's a good question for you then. So where do you think the biggest lessons and leadership will learn for you then i mean obviously like you said you had time in the marine corps you had time in the seals um so if we mash those two together as like the training side of it and then the combat side of it were, were your biggest kind of skills and leadership learned in the training or did you learn some of the biggest lessons out there actually in the field when it was all being tried and tested what well, you know the answer is both but we have a saying in the military a couple of sayings is you don't rise to the occasion you fall to your level of training. And so training is the environment to where the battles won before you even step onto the, uh, the field of battle. And even then, you know, training can only take so far in terms of certain scenarios and you run into scenarios on the battlefield for which my guy solved them. I didn't, I, I always considered my guys around me, like my brain trust, they were faster, they were stronger, they were uh, more tactically proficient uh, and they were smarter. They were smarter than me. In any problem I threw their way, they would come together collectively and solve it. But, you know, if you step onto into any profession without training for the task, you're, you're usually going to fail miserably. Maybe there is that 1% that are just such talented people that they'll get it right. I, I don't fall in that 1%. So it was the constant training we did that set me up for success on the battlefield uh, paired with the amazing men and women I was surrounded with. Brilliant answer, man. No, yeah, absolutely. That's a... That's very true. I like I like the quote there. So I think I might have to make a lot of quote posts out of that one. But so yeah, following the combat and stuff, you served, as you said earlier, the SEAL Junior Officer Training Course Director at BUDS. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, admittedly, a role that carries a lot of importance right there. So was that transition uh, from kicking doors to training those guys a massive challenge for you? And how, you know, how quickly did you find that footing? And I guess the leadership principles are kind of um, universal to that, are they? Well, so you know, when I stepped over to Buds and I was the director of that little course and I, I had bosses above me, 
I, like the sense of motivation and like the just how much responsibility fell on my shoulders to help these young men become better leaders than I was, which is the whole point. The whole point of leadership is not only to drive results in the job, but also create the next generation of leaders to be better than we were. And I was so motivated in, in the, the, the weight of that responsibility. Like I wanted to pass all my knowledge from my three combat deployments to them. And even then, you know, my proficiency had only scratched the surface. I got a lot more proficiency when I went to the Joint Special Operations Command. And, um, oh man, th those young men uh, who are now like commanders and captains in the Navy today, they were just like sponges. They wanted, they wanted everything. They wanted to know your failures. They wanted to know your successes. And, uh, you know, I'm not the sort of guy that's a, a, like a drill instructor. I'm more of the big brother. So even though they were junior in rank to me, I, I treated them as peers. And when we would go out to the field together, I'd be right there with them. And if they screwed up, I'd be like, hey, that's okay. Let's just, let's all gather around. Let's talk about what he just did. Maybe we can learn from it. Nobody cast judgment uh, towards that individual. So no, I, it was, it was such a rewarding tour. It was short lived. It was only six months, uh, because then I, I had to, uh, go to this other unit to try out for them. But had it been a longer tour, I, I it would have been, it would have been worth it. Just training the next generation to, to go do and to, to go forth and do, uh, what they do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so going forward from there, then, like you said, Joint Special Operations Command, I think known as JSOC. Um, forgive me, I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit unsure of exactly what the mission is with that and what that exactly is. So could you just run me and the listeners quickly through what uh, that is, what the mission is there, and kind of what you guys get up to over there? What does, what does it look like? Yeah, it's it's analogous to uh, your your SPS or your SAS Special Air Service or the Special Boat Service uh, over there in the Isles. Um, it, which is counterterrorism and um, uh, hard to get over there. Uh, very, very few make it um, from the SEAL teams. Um, again, just squeezed by by the uh, the skin of my teeth um, and the level of performance and the standard there was much, much higher, which I had to fight to stay there every day because, again, I was surrounded by just just exemplary human beings in every, every way. But... Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to go into the mission or the, the roles uh, too much. It's just, let's just say I have a very important mission and they're constantly deployed forward uh, doing very important work that secures peace and prosperity for Americans uh, at home. Right. I see. Okay. Very interesting. Um, I have to uh, uh, dig into that a bit more then. So um, one more for the, um, you know, for, for the Dunn's hat questions I wanted to ask today, actually, as well, a uh, little kind of bucket list of things I wanted to get out of the way. Um, so what actually classifies a tier one operator then? Um, I've, I've kind of wondered this for a while. I know that tier one obviously is the you know tip of the spear, the highest quality, but what, what qualifies to be tier one um, and universally? Because I know there's tier one units um, from different countries as well. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, there, there actually was a great uh, TV show that just came out, uh, Rogue Heroes. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. It was uh, produced in uh, the UK uh, about the SAS in their infancy in North Africa. Um, so SAS really forged the way for um, a lot of special operations and how they design their assessment and selection pro uh, process. But to become a tier one operator, even though you've gone through SEAL training or you've gone through the special forces qualification course, uh, you've got to go through another assessment and selection, which is about eight to nine months. And uh, it is just the most anxiety inducing uh, thing I've ever done. And um, a very few percentage uh, make it. It's a very uh, high standard, um, but the ones that make it through have a, a huge sense of accomplishment. And then once you graduate and move to a unit, uh, the work doesn't stop. It's just, you're, you're, you're constantly uh, forward. You're constantly training. Um, the, the, what we refer to as the operational tempo is, is very quick. Uh, there are guys that stay there for, for the majority of their career who I just don't understand how they, they go past like six years. Some stay 10, some stay 15, some stay 20. Uh, but we keep that corporate knowledge within those units. So it's one of the only places in the military you could pretty much stay there for your entire career. Um, 
but just think of a, of a higher caliber special operations soldier. Um, statistically, we're, we, we've got an older age than your average Royal Marines or SEAL platoon, where I think the average age is like anywhere from 21 to 23. Uh, the guys at those tier one units are much older. They, they are good at problem solving. They're, they're good at stepping into environments where there's no guidance, there's no rules, um, and putting process and procedure and structure in place to achieve whatever they're assigned uh, as a mission. And uh, I'll tell you what, it was like a master's or a doctorate in leaders leadership. The leaders I had at those units uh, were both senior enlisted and officers were phenomenal. And that's where I think the most coaching and mentorship took place for me, watching people that just do the right thing day in and day out, even when it's unpopular, even when they're uncomfortable. And uh, that's why I probably only lasted six years. I just, I, oh, I couldn't maintain that tempo. And uh, it was the hardest decision I ever had to make to say, hey, um, one of the younger guys coming behind me will have more vigor, uh, is probably smarter and can do a better job uh, than I can. And saying goodbye to my tribe was, uh, it, it was one of the most difficult decisions in my life. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, that, that brotherhood is something tough to uh, to leave behind for sure. But then obviously you've gone into the entrepreneurial side of things and you've you've started all the ventures that you have, like the uh, the plethora of list of stuff that you've uh, mentioned at the start, which is just fantastic and really, uh, re you know, credit to you. Obviously, you've taken a lot of that leadership and you put it into that. So um, before we kind of get into like the actionable stuff for, um, you know, businesses and entrepreneurs out there right now, just quickly then. So coming out the military, um, starting these things, was that something that you started after you left or were you kind of spinning plates a little bit uh, before you left while you were still in? Um, how did that look for you and, and starting those businesses? I'll tell you what, when you're at a tier one unit, you've got one mission that's to be really, really good at your job. And uh, very few guys have uh, other ventures going on just due to the time commitments uh, at those units. So you know, what, what I did was I stepped out of the military and went and got a, a master's in business administration uh, just to, to learn some fundamentals uh, on businesses. Uh, I knew that like new venture creation entrepreneurship was the path I wanted to go because I love starting something from scratch and seeing if I can turn it into something of value to, to people. And I've, I've failed. I've had some textbook failures, but I love it. And then the additional part of it is forging a small team within those businesses and pouring into them because um, I don't have a lot of money to pay people. So, uh, you know, turning them into really high-performing individuals, which if the company does well, they start to do better. And um, it's been a challenge, man. Uh, there are some things that translate. The military taught us everything we know to be successful in life. And you just have to apply those same principles in the military that made you successful with discipline and uh, commitment to business. And if you can run a consistent business, ultimately leadership and behavior are, I'm sorry, leadership and culture are about behavior. Leadership is about behavior. Culture is trying to produce that behavior at a mass scale, whether it's a company of 20 or a company of 1000. Can I make everyone's actions consistent? Because consistency usually leads to great outcomes. Um, and that's been a challenge. And, and, and I'm, I'm coming on six years out of the military. So I'm still young, uh, or I'm a new guy within this 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 world called uh, the private sector or the business world. So I'm still figuring things out as well. But I'll tell you what doesn't change is the the leadership uh, and culture building that we did within the uh, the military. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you talk so much about leadership and um, uh, a lot of it is, uh, at least in my eye, a lot of it's outward leadership. Like you're talking about how you lead other people and stuff. But at least, you know, my, my understanding, uh, especially from personal experience over the last few few months, few years and stuff, is that you can't lead outwardly and, until you lead inwardly. And um, so obviously I think that, you know, leading outwardly is, is an attainable thing. You can, like you said, it can be forged, it can be taught, but you need to be able to lead yourself inwardly and in the things you're doing. So, um, you know, what, what have you got for me on applying personal leadership into your own life? And if, you, if someone's listening right now, who's got, you know, a bit lazy, procrastinating maybe, and they know it, maybe held back by some bad habits. Um, you know, where does that start? Where does that end in terms of, uh, in terms of getting onto the right path? 
Well, you know, I always say uh, you can't lead others if you don't know thyself. So uh, I wrote two books, The Talent Warhouse, Special Operations, and Great Organizations Win on Talent. That was the first book, and that was very organizationally outward focused. And then as I was doing the speaking tour for that book with companies, a lot of people would come to me and say, how do I apply this to my, 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 my personal life? And so I'm like, damn it, I totally got this out of order. I should have written my second book first, which is called The Everyday Warrior, A No-Hack Practical Approach to Life. And everything I wrote in The Everyday Warrior, which is available on Amazon, um, was from the things I learned from watching these high-performing individuals I called teammates. And so it's not a book about me, but how they live their lives with routine, with habits, with consistency, and how they were so relatively balanced compared to a lot of human beings we, we, we don't see that are balanced. And, you know, you've got to know thyself. You've got to do a personal assessment of your strengths, your weaknesses, and what you need to improve in order to get to whatever destination you're heading to. Uh, and a lot of people, that's, that's another thing. A lot of people don't know where they're heading. And as the saying goes, uh, if you're going nowhere, all the, all the roads lead to it. And, um, you, there's a lot of wasted, uh, movement. And so, you know, within the everyday warrior, I talk about this one step at a time approach. Everyone is looking for shortcuts and hacks and shortcuts and hacks do nothing but waste time and it's wasted movement. It, you know, I'll give you an example. If you want to lose 50 pounds, most people say, I want to lose 50 pounds. They start and then they quit within, I think most goals fail within the first 17 days. It's because they don't have a plan in place. So the everyday warrior talked about how in the military, we knew we had this destination and then we would do something called reverse planning. So if I want to lose 50 pounds, let me break that up into 50 milestones with dates assigned to it. And then I'm going to ask for an accountability partner. My, my partner, Will uh, Sharman, who's in the other room. Hey man, I want to lose 50 pounds. Will you make sure that you check in with me to talk through my progress what I can do better, what I'm doing well. And, you know, you want to just take those 50 milestones one step at a time, knock out that next stone, knock out that next one. And and before you know it, you're on the path to achieving your goals. But so many people are just wandering aimlessly in life without really qualifying and quantifying their goals. And they're ambiguous, 50 pounds. Well, you can break that down into so many things. I want to look better. I want, like, I want my photos to be better. Uh, I want to feel healthier. Um, and if you really take time to scope out that goal and how to achieve it and do the reverse planning, things become a lot more uh, achievable and, and you're, you're wasting less movement because the one thing that nobody can get back is time. So even for myself, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm efficient and effective with my time because I've got a family, I've got these businesses, I've got friends, uh, I've got my hobbies like skydiving. Uh, and I want to make sure that I have time for all of them. And that ebbs and flows. You know it with a business, with a podcast. Seems like it eats up your day and, and maybe your health will 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 ebb a little bit. That's just life. And then you learn from it and, and learn how to balance those as best as possible. Yeah, sound advice, absolutely. Um I I'd love if you could um if you could give me a little kind of a rating of, or maybe just point out if I'm missing anything and in, in how I'm attacking my personal goals at the moment. So I'm working out of a to-do list in my notes and it's basically like check boxes. So I'll have every single day, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll copy and paste like the list of things I need to get done every day. So that goes from personal health stuff, which is like the training, yeah, you know, supplements, um, then you know, like daily run, daily walk. Then there's like I also have a goal to do 100 press ups a day, so four sets, 25 press ups. Then I've got the business stuff, which is like the personal brand, my uh, fights on business, Anvil. Um, so two different businesses. So like the, the social media stuff, the accounts, the um, YouTube video, the podcast, reaching out to guests for the podcast, just loads of these little little things. And then at the bottom, there's like an extras bit too, which is the kind of the extra things, which are an anomaly almost in a sense. So I kind of get this sense of like I need to tick all these things off because it's kind of like maybe a slight um, OCD thing because I just want to see all of them done. And then at the end of the week, I've got a debrief bit where I'll look through all of it, see what I've been missing out on. Um, and then I'll go and say, okay, this week I'm going to add this to the list. I'm going to take this out. I'm going to change this and I'm going to make some improvements here. And then also like a bit that's about what have I like absolutely nailed this week. And now I've gone from kind of like 20 uh, to do's a day or something to like 40 50 and i'm kind of just rolling with it so am i missing anything there is there anything i need to add to that um how is it 
you, you said some real positive things there. Um, mainly the fact, and I talked about this in the book, you know, you've got to take the time to reflect. If you want to call it an after action review, a debrief, which I call it the art of the debrief, that is great. That is the, the number one organizational and like individual tool for self-improvement because you're constantly assessing the things you do and can I do them better? What I, what I usually say is start, stop, continue. I need to start doing these things because I'm not moving towards my goal. I need to stop these bad habits or these things that are just what I call time sucks. And I need to continue these best practices that are helping me achieve my goals. Start, stop, continue. Um, but dude, you, you've got a busy schedule. The one thing I'll say is the one thing you can control in life is your health. Never, ever lose that one. I can't affect what other people do. And it's sort of like stoicism. Uh, learn to accept the things you can ch uh, can change and also learn the, to accept the things you uh, you can't. Another thing too is as you're going through that process and you're looking at that to-do list, you got to ask yourself, are some of these things on, li on this list, one, are they driving value for either other people or myself? Are they driving impact? And if they're not, are they truly important? Do they deserve to be on this list? If they're not, get rid of them. Another thing is the power of no. So, this has to do with tribe a little bit. Be very careful about the people you surround yourself with. I always try to find people that are just better human beings than I am that have these lofty goals because I learn from them. Iron sharpens iron, so is one person sharpens another. Again, I said it again. And you know, you've got to learn the power of no. There's a lot of people that will want your time, but not be willing to give back to you. And it's like, you know, buddies, I I you know, you have multiple tribes in your life and you can be part of multiple tribes at one time. Uh, you know, I was with a tribe that went out third to the bar Thursday through Sunday. They were out Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And I'd wake up with a hangover every day. And especially on Monday when it starts a week. And eventually, you know, they'd be like, Hey, we're going to the bar. Let's go. And I'd be like, no, I can't, I can't do this anymore because it's, it's taking me down a path where I'm achieving less. And so the power of no uh, it does not mean you're being rude to somebody. It's not saying that you don't have the time for them. It's just saying, no, based off my life trajectory and where I want to be, this doesn't provide value towards achieving those goals. So the power of no is huge. And that's one I had to learn. Um, hey, will you come speak to our company for free? No, I've got a wife. I've got two kids. I've got a, a kid on the way. No, if it doesn't provide value for my family right now, I can't do it. I hope to get into a point where I'm financially, let's just say solvent, where I can take more of those pro bono things. I'll, I'll do it for when military asked me to come in and speak to them or, or maybe a nonprofit, I'll, I'll do my best to do it. I'm not looking to, to, to make money, but the power no has been, uh, a, I would say something that I'm working on and getting a lot better. Um, and I'll, I'll explain it to people too. Say, hey, no, and this is why. I don't owe them the why, but I'll, I'll just be very candid and direct. And, you know, how they take that is, is, is not my problem. That's usually a you problem. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Great, great, great advice there. I totally agree. And now I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, you approve of the, um, of the method and everything. And, um, you know, the, the debrief stuff is something I picked up out of the blue angels and, uh, talking to, uh, commander John Fay, who's the, the XO out there. They're, they are just, um, you know, top, top tier at, at debrief. And, you know, they speak a lot about it and it's, it's big out there for them. Um, but yeah, something like one more thing I want to ask as well. So something I feel like maybe I have been missing, or maybe I'm just being a little bit pedant pedantic with it is um, uh, like in the special forces and stuff. I know for a fact that you guys are massive on like a pre-brief as well. And like kind of going into things and going into ops um, you've got the structure and everything going into it, like absolutely down to a T Um is that necessary going into a week to have like a pre-brief or is it just enough to have like a really good debrief at the end of the week? Um, and if you were to say, yeah, like on Monday morning or Sunday night, you should have a pre-brief for the week. You know, what am I going to lay out? What am I achieving here? What am I going to try and do? How would you structure that? Um, or is it necessary if you've got a great debrief going on? They're, they're both, both equally important. I mean, that's like going into any daunting task without a plan is like setting yourself up for failure. That pre-brief is, is basically to make sure that as much information about what we're going to do is spread across the organization, whoever's going out on that mission. You want to arm them with that information. You also want to arm them with what they have to do 
during that mission to achieve success for the overall organization. And they also need to understand what everyone else is doing. Um, and, you know, when people understand that, if somebody is struggling with a scenario over here and somebody knows their roles and responsibilities, they can pick that up from for a short period of time until that obstacle is cleared. And they say, you got it, you got it. I'm going back to my duties. So um, because we have so many moving parts, you've got helicopters, you've got vehicles, you've got 40 people on the ground. You've got to have a plan going in. If not, you know, cue the circus music. It will look like a complete and utter clown show. But great professional organizations from the All Blacks in rugby to the Blue Angels to, to special operations, they come back for that debrief. And it's, uh, they basically ask a couple of questions. Okay, what was planned? What really happened? What did we do well? But more importantly, what did we do poorly and we need to fix right now moving forward? So that's how everyone's learning. And especially for the younger uh, soldiers in the in the element or the younger people within your organization, as they hear this, you're maturating them at a quicker rate compared to organizations that don't do that debrief. So they're learning in the leaders start with the debrief. Leaders go first so that they're saying, hey, I screwed up this, 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 and this. And the younger people in the room are like, oh, it's okay to admit that you made a mistake. We're all learning from each other here. And then they'll share their mistakes. Sometimes as a more senior tenured individual would be like, hey, that's okay. I did the same thing when I was uh, at your level of the organization. Here's what I learned about it. And here's how I would approach it uh, differently. So they're both both equally uh, important. It's like starting a business without uh, going through the sort of business design, the market analysis. If you don't do those critical things, dude, that business, 99% uh, probability that business is going to fail within the first year, if not first three years. Mm, great points. Um so if you are um if you're an individual listening in who's you know got clipboard and a notepad in hand taking notes here and everything um obviously not to reveal you know <laughs> trades and uh, trades and secrets and stuff from the SEAL teams or whatever but you know from your at least personal experience and point of view and stuff and and what you would um instruct to people so if you were looking to develop a personal or a team sort of pre-brief into going into a week or a project or something how would you kind of like at least the bare bones kind of structure that like where would you say okay we're going to start with and we're going to end with like what's the sort of like at least skeletal layout of a, a great pre-brief in your opinion yeah absolutely so one uh clarity of what we're trying to achieve and why we're trying to achieve it. You got to be very like, Hey, I want to lose weight. Okay. That's great. Let, let's, let's actually provide some clarity and, 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 and nail down what you're truly trying to achieve other than just losing weight. Is that 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds. Let's be very specific with our desired outcomes or end state. And then why are we doing this? When people understand why you're doing it, let's be like, Hey, you know, we, we, we want to, we want to hit 1,000, or I'm sorry, 1 million in revenue this year. And this is why. And this is why it's so critical to the organization, so critical to you all who are employed by the company. And in an ambiguous situation when they're trying to achieve that goal, if they understand why they're doing it, they can maneuver accordingly. They can take the right actions to still push the company towards that goal. So the what and the why are very uh, critical. How each person contributes to that victory or the desired end state is critical. And then take that goal. If it's to raise $1 million, do that reverse planning technique, which is not uh, proprietary to special operations, the SEALs, all, all great organizations do that. So we want to, within 365 days, achieve $1 million in revenue and then break it down by either uh, month, quarters, all the way to the start point so that people know what to do day one to get to 250,000, if that's the biggest milestone by the end of quarter one, and give them roles and responsibilities, key actions they have to take. What are the communi communication channel? And let's be honest here, communications is nine tenths of every solution. And as human beings, we're getting worse at it because we default to uh, forms of e-communication, text, email, which people can't get full context uh, unless somebody's just a really articulate writer um, a skilled writer, it's hard to get context through a, a text message. Uh, communication is so vital to every organization. Um, and a lot of people just don't do it well. What do you do when you don't make that goal? What do you, what do you do when you don't hit that? So you've said 300, like, you know, 365 days ago today, let's say I set this goal. I didn't achieve it. I wasn't even close to it. 
what do you do then how do you how do you approach um you know figuring that out i mean if you're a personal uh individual sole trader or, or an entrepreneur or something you haven't launched that business yet uh are you, are you due a, a self ass kicking like how do you uh, how do you approach it so uh, you know again failure to reach your goals is not an indictment in your uh, of your character unless you can look in the mirror and be like nope i had no discipline had no commitment no accountability i was lazy hey that that that's fair don't beat yourself up about it but go into that debrief as you just said Okay, hey guys, we 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 finished uh, this year at eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars in revenue. That's that's good. We didn't hit our goal, so let's dissect this. Let's let's get in a room for eight hours. In eight hours is not a lot to ask for the next three hundred and sixty-five days. Let's get in a room for eight hours. Let's again ask those questions: What was planned? What went according to plan? What did we do well, and what did we do poorly? How do we improve in in, in a different way moving forward? to hit that mark for the next year, it, unless you're going to, you know, up that bar. Hey, we only did 850,000. We should have done 1 million. So I'm not lowering the bar. I'm actually raising the bar. I want to do 1.1 million. And again, I'm looking at each of you. How do we get there? And what did we learn from this last year that didn't quite work out? And how do we change moving forward? In those conversations, we'd love to think, you know, the biggest uh, misnomer about communication is that it ever happened. And you know, the other thing people get wrong is, well, let's say we did do 1.1 million. You should still get in a room for eight hours and still debrief it and say, okay, we actually exceeded our goal, but there's some things we probably still did poorly to where we could have gotten 1.25. And there's some things we did well, that start, stop and continue. What do we need to start doing differently? What do we need to stop? That was just, that it wasn't an efficient use of our time or dollars. And what do we need to continue that helped us reach that mark? And now will help us get to 1.25 million. So you debrief both your successes and your failures. And what I see a lot of organizations is they only get in a room when things fail. I want to codify, I want to qualify and quantify what we did well that helped us reach this goal, if not succeed it. And then I want to sort of memorialize it. I want to institutionalize it. I want to write it down so that as we get new people on board, they understand the things that we did in that year to make us successful that exceeded that uh, that goal. Yeah, great answers there. Absolutely, I totally agree. Um, I think last thing I want to ask now um, before we kind of wrap this up, which has been a great podcast, by the way, really has. Um, so I think the very last question would have to be between business and combat. If we draw if we draw a line between those two. Uh, and we kind of joined them up, at least in combat, what was some of like, at least maybe like a top three or a top two of the tactics slash principles slash practices that were most effective out there, um, you know, ac across the wire uh, that were also equally effective in at least like your first few years of business and what you've seen in other businesses too. So like, you know, what's been, what's been working really well that also worked really well out uh, in combat? Yeah, so, you know, they're vastly different. Um, I'm going to be honest, I find starting businesses and running businesses a lot harder than combat. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no disrespect to any soldier. Uh, I'm with you guys. I was there with you. Um, but you got to understand in like special operations, we had such a strong support network that set us up for success. We had Intel analysts, we had logistics specialists. We, we, you know, we had administrative specialists, um, operational specialists that, that just, and we had a lot of money. In, in the business world, I've never met with a more resource-constrained environment. As a startup, I don't want to take on investors because that changes the culture. Um, man, it's been hard. It's I would rather go back to combat 10 times than, uh, than start another business. But you know, we were just on a call today with the venture capital group. We, we may be starting a, another adventure company. And one of the people is like, hey, we'll have people climbing this mountain over here. And then there's a smaller mountain over here. We'll have climbing people this one. And I'm like, Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's keep this simple. Simplicity is the ultimate form of communication. If we have people climbing a mountain over here and people climbing a mountain over here, we've just doubled the amount of logistical constraint, the amount of uh, complexity. Let's, let's, let's keep everyone focused. Let's all climb on one mountain so that we can have our medical staff. We can have our operations teams just focused on that one mountain. And we can sort of remove two communication channels in, in sing, put it into one singular uh, focus and communication channel. 
So simplicity in whatever we do, if people think special operations are different than your, your average uh, line infantry platoon, they're not. We're all using the same tactics. What I called special operations is they were masters of the basics. So what a lot of people uh, tend to do in the business world is like, oh, we're going to have this product. We're going to have this service. We're going to do this and this and this. And now you've got 20 lines uh, of products and services. You're starting out. Let's, if you imagine it's a bullseye, let's have one product and let's fill that bullseye until it's full. Let's get all our rounds into that bullseye. Let's get so good at that one singular thing before we move on to the next, because you're going to learn so much with that product and service. And after a year or two, then you can say, okay, now we can expand our product line or our service line. But when you try to do too much and make it so complex right from the start, you're almost dooming yourself to fail. Mm, great, great stuff. Um, well, I think that that kind of nearly wraps it up. Last thing that I want to um, last thing that I want to ask just quickly, then something going forward to the podcast. Um, I want to relay at least a little bit to the people coming on, on who are in the future. If you found a 12, 13, 14 year old Mike running around the streets right now, um, what would be kind of like your top bit of life advice, or uh, uh, what would you what would be the message you want to at least you know relay to to young you? Uh, to young me, man, you got one hell of a ride in front of you. Work your ass off. Uh, really cherish the people that are going to be in your life. Get to know them extremely well. And uh, take it one step at a time. You're going to fail a lot. That is the process of life. But enjoy the journey because it's more rewarding reward, rewarding than the destination, any goals you may have. What you learn along the journey has always been more valuable than achieving some world record or finishing some mission. Um, and as I look back at that journey, I'm like, damn, damn, dude, I've served alongside some amazing people. We did some amazing things. We failed a whole lot, but we did it together as a team. And let me say one more thing, dude. You are really good at this. I have a podcast and I am not, as good as you. So kudos to you, man. You've, you've now got a follower for talk four. You've, you, you are very, very good at this and, and just your style and your approach and the questions I've, I've learned from, uh, from being on this podcast. Oh man, that's the, uh, that, that is the biggest compliment I think I could ever get. And, you know, I, I think that's, um, yeah, I'm going to take, um, take your lead there quickly and just relay a little bit of, uh, a bit of me into that too my god if you go back to episode one and you have a listen to that first episode holy shit i sounded like uh so wooden dude i I've, it makes me cringe almost but that's the point that i want to get across with that is just my god if you can stay consistent with it like we've spoken about this whole podcast if you stick with your list you stick with what you're doing you stick with all of the stuff that we've mentioned here and you do that debrief and you look at what could have been better i started with no video I, uh, my questions were very different. It was a lot shorter. Um, like I said, at least no video feed either. And it's just been an evolution of about two and a quarter years or something now getting to this point. So yeah, put, put the reps in. It's, it's going to, um, it's going to pay off hundred percent. Cause I was no graphic designer or podcaster, but here we are. And I've just had the, the, uh, the Holy grail compliment from, uh, from Mike here, but yeah, that's the, uh, that's what I got for you today. That's my questions. Uh, before we wrap it up, shameless plug away, Mike. So, uh, feel free to, uh, send us over to social media website or whatever you've got going on and, uh, we'll get people, uh, uh over to your channels. Yeah. Shamelessly. I I've got my own personal website now. Um, Mike Sorelli.com. Uh, and you can find me there all through all socials. I'm not all that active on socials. I've got a team that, that sort of runs it. So there's not that much personal stuff. It's all business focused. Uh, probably why I have a low following. I just, I'm private with with a lot of things in my life uh, other than uh, my outward businesses. But um, yeah, reach out. If you got any questions, mikesrelly.com. I'm pretty uh, pretty fast at responding to people. Wicked, Mike. Well, thank you so much for joining me today for the Talk Before podcast. Absolute pleasure having you on, man. Thank you, brother. It's been good, guys. Thanks for listening. Episode 103. If you'd like to listen to the past ones, go and have a look at the channel. And if you'd like to listen for the future ones, we've got a great guest coming on on Monday. Um, obviously, I don't like to spoil things because, you know, some people can change plans or whatever. But we've, uh, we're have we having a look at 
Samuel Raz Larson, F22 Raptor demo pilot. Really looking forward to speaking to him. That's a big aviation fan. So that's going to be a good one. Guys, um, like I said, go subscribe, go hit the, uh, the like button, leave a comment. And um, as for now, good night, people. Fight on. See you in the next episode.